Jessica. <laughs> um, so uh, the readings tonight are part of, as it says, the, um, the anniversary of Marshall is celebrating 150 years this year. And, um, and so we've put the, together this collection of um, stories and articles. Um, Jim Tate. I think we'll be uh, kind enough to tell you a little bit more about uh, where some of these stories have come from. And, um, and so we've just um, kind of collected a bunch of people from a bunch of different areas um, around campus and around town to, um, to provide us with a couple of these articles. So uh, we're going to get started here first with Bill Molso coming to talk to us about a new school in Marshall. Well, this was uh, kind of a fun one to read because, uh, as many of you know, we just opened a new school here in Marshall, so we kind of got to relive a little history here. And uh, back in January, when they were tearing down West Side School, they discovered a time capsule in the cornerstone of the building. And so when we opened that in January, there was an article in there in the Marshall Messenger from 1954 that I thought, wow, there are really a lot of similarities between this uh, article from April 23rd, 1886, and October of 1954. So it's titled, uh, A Grand Project, and this is in the News Messenger. Marshall votes $20,000 for a schoolhouse. One of the grandest public acts yet performed in the village of Marshall occurred last Monday evening when the citizens of this school district voted almost unanimously to build a $20,000 schoolhouse. The meeting was one of the happiest and most satisfying we ever beheld. There were nearly 100 persons present, three-fourths of whom were entitled to vote on school matters. The meeting was called to order by C.F. Case, chairman of the school board, who briefly stated why the meeting was called, which was to consider a proposition to buy additional land for school purposes and the question of building a new school building. A.C. Forbes drew a resolution for the purchase of the four lots on the northwest and northeast of the present school land at a price not exceeding $1,125 and moved its adoption. Without a word of dissent, the resolution was passed. These lots comprised the two owned by the Methodist Church and the two owned by C.M. Wilcox and the original town site owners. The purchase gives to the school building all of that block except the lots of the Congregational Church and CF Case. The matter of erecting a new schoolhouse was introduced through a resolution by G.M. Durst, which, when amended, proposed the erection of a school building to be completed by the first day of October next, for which the district was to place in bonds in a sum not exceeding $20,000. Principal Tibbles was asked to give his views regarding the necessity for a new building, and he did so in a clear and convincing manner, showing the present building to be not only too limited to accommodate its pupils, but utterly unfit for a school for want of proper sanitary conditions. From April 23, 1886. Thanks, Bill. And our next article is from just a month later in a much somber note. This is Scarlet Fever, uh, read by May Levu. Okay, so I found a lot of similarities when I was reading this article to current times. And so, anyways, this article is called um, Scarlet Fever. Our neighboring town of Tracy and Ballotin are sorely afflicted with scarlet fever, and several deaths have occurred. No towns are exempt from the dreaded disease, and about the only preventative measures to be taken are cleanliness and good sanitary arrangements. Low and level lands, want of drainage, badly arranged vaults and cesspools, and wells abounding in surface drainage are the general causes of scarlet fever and diphtheria, and may largely be abated or improved. A few years ago, Marshall suffered severely from these diseases, and more than a score of deaths resulted. The Board of Health has wisely taken steps to more thoroughly cleanse the village of offal, garbage, and manure, and their demands should be immediately heeded. Otherwise, those who fail to comply will be summarily dealt with. This community, as well as that of Tracy, will extend its deep sympathy to Dr. Farrow in the loss of two of his children by scarlet fever, one a girl of two and a half years, and the other his oldest boy, about 14 years of age. 
they were ill but a few days and died Saturday and Sunday. The many acquaintances of the Northrop family in Ballotin will also sympathize with them in their loss of their son, Caleb, aged 14 years, by the same disease. Doctors Persons and Weimer were called in consultation at Tracy, and Dr. Persons was called to the cases in Ballotin. Thank you. Um, our next reader is Dr. Ross Wasbed, and he's going to be reading about a problem that just doesn't seem to go away. These are two articles, one from 1886 and another addressing the same subject from 1939. So here's a, here's a different kind of health concern, temperance. <laughs> so this one is from 1886, temperance work begun. A temperance meeting was held at the Methodist Church Monday evening in view of organizing a society of the home guards. A temporary chairman was chosen and the constitution and bylaws were read, after which a motion was made which was discussed at some length. When the vote was taken in favor of organization and, as it is the object of the society, to enlist all the friends of temperance in this work, it was thought best to defer the completion of the organization until Monday evening, August 30th. At this time, a brief entertainment will be given, followed by the election of officers. All are invited to be present. We believe the sentiment of this community will strongly sustain such an organization, but the real work will have to be done by a few. Therefore, start right with good men in office. And so 53 years later, we have a temperance proclamation. Whereas, it is fitting and proper that all citizens of the state do all in their power to promote temperance and sobriety and whereas it is to be de desired that all pastors, young people's organizations, and others interested in the social welfare of the people should unite in a program of education sponsoring clean living and the building of physical well-being. Now therefore I, Harold E. Stassen, Governor of the State of Minnesota, do hereby proclaim Sunday, May 7th, 1939, as Minnesota Temperance Sunday, and urge all citizens to lend their efforts to the promotion of temperance and sobriety. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the great seal of the State of Minnesota to be affixed this 10th day of April in the year of our Lord, 1,939. Harold E. Stassen. Uh, our next article, our next reader, Jordan Stanglin, uh, Jordan's gonna be reading an article about uh, a motion picture that came to Marshall. And, uh, and this wasn't included last week when we did it because the, um, the article that was sent was about some other things, and then there was this little two and a half sentences on the top of the cutoff PDF that said Hollywood Studios, and I'm like, what is that there? <laughs> and so Pam Gladys went back into the archives, and she found this article about the Seahawk coming to Marshall. So this is, like Sheila said, an article about Seahawk and it is from uh, December 26, 1924, right after Christmas. Oh boy. Seahawk, a picture of adventure coming. Old galley ships in battle, slaves, buccaneers, corsairs, and adventure transformed at Barrymore next week, three nights. A real treat is in store for picture fans on next Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday when the Seahawk comes to the Barrymore. It took many months for Frank Lloyd to bring Sabatine's great story to life on the screen and thousands of players. To get some idea of the magnitude of the play, we give some facts regarding the production. 14 big stars appear in leading parts. 3,000 extras were employed. 70 cooks supplied food daily. 
71 technicians were employed. Four old-time galley ships were constructed at a cost of two hundred and seventy-five hundred thousand uh, dollars. Four high-powered speedboats with four hundred horsepower Liberty Motors transferred director and company from ship to ship. Sixty-four sailors handled sea craft carrying uh, cameramen. Sorry, the uh, text is a little small. Uh, one of the ships was beached during a Pacific Ocean storm, the only way to save it. Costume costs amount to $85,000. Company lived on Catalina Island through storms and hurricanes for six weeks. Seven sea captains assisted in manning, uh, maneuvering old-time sea craft. 200 expert oarmen were chosen for galley slave scenes. In the first two weeks of filming, the company consumed 2,118 pounds of beef, 714 pounds of veal, 385 pounds of chicken, 604 pounds of fish, 419 pounds of ham and bacon, 385 pounds of coffee, ooh, relatable, uh, 105 pounds of tea, 2,915 loaves of bread, 1,117 dozens of eggs. An entire 16th century Moorish village was constructed. Wireless and three airplanes kept the company in daily touch with the Hollywood studios. Yeah. So just so we know how much beef was consumed. Um, our next reader is Kristen Kovar. That, that one's a little hard to follow. So um, this article is from March 4th, 1927. It is titled, Pastors Ask Papers to Print Names and Fines of Convicted Bootleggers. The Lyon County Ministerial Association, at its monthly meeting at the New Atlantic Hotel on Monday, adopted the following resolution. Resolved that we ask the newspapers of the county to publish all the names of the men convicted in municipal and district court for the violation of that part of the liquor law that deals with bootlegging. Resolved also that the amount of the fine and prison or jail sentence be published. Resolved that we ask the president of the ministerial association to go to the clerk of court and get the names of all liquor law violators convicted, the sentences imposed, the sentences actually served, that we also get the names of the lawyers who are in habit of defending the bootleggers and report these to the next meeting of the association. The association will sponsor a greater church attendance campaign between now and Easter. <laughs> awesome. That's funny. Uh, all right. So Kat's very upset because this is really hard to read this one. Um, but, um, but she's retiring, so I don't care. <laughs> uh, so this is about new traffic codes. I told um, Sheila that because I'm a registrar, she's having me read about rules and regulations. <laughs> um, just to set the tone a little bit, um, this article is Friday, April 29th, 1927. Um, the U.S. is still in the Roaring Twenties. We're also in Prohibition. Um, and the big thing that happened in 1927 was the Charles Lindbergh flight. Um, Calvin Coolidge is the president. And this article, um, the rules came in effect when our governor signed them into effect the week before April 29th. And the governor of Minnesota in 1927 was a man by the name of Theodore Christensen. And his nickname was Tightwad Ted. <laughs> and he is actually from um, Dawson, Minnesota. And he was the editor of the newspaper and a lawyer. So just to set that up a little bit. New traffic code is forward step. Babcock Avers urges county 
and municipal authorities to enforce rules. It is now unlawful to coast cars downgrade in neutral. Windshield bathing beauties, campaign cards, and posters must go. <laughs> Automobile accidents in Lyon County and elsewhere in Minnesota can be materially reduced if all motorists and others using the streets and highways would carefully observe the new traffic code, which went into effect when it was signed by the governor last week. A number of safety rules, which have long been observed by cautious motorists, but disregarded by others, have now been written into law. So unlawful to coast. Here it is, hereafter it will be unlawful to stand in a roadway to solicit a ride except from a public conveyance. Hitch to motor vehicles with tob toboggans, sleds, or bicycles. Coast cars downgrade with gears in neutral. Jump on or into a vehicle without the owner's consent. That's board any public conveyance while in motion. I love this one. Display bathing beauties, campaign cards, or other posters on windshields or windows. Just can't do that anymore. Use a muffler cutout on any highway. Operate a car without a windshield wiper. Make unnecessary noise or operating a vehicle as to emit excessive smoke. I think we had a little problem with that a couple years ago, um, some kids running doing that. Use siren compression or spark plug whistles on any except police or fire vehicles. Police and fire cars must be equipped with a siren, bell, or exhaust whistle. Use red or green lights visible from in front of any vehicle except police and fire vehicles. Place cars with for sale signs on streets or highways. That must not be a law anymore. Um, use a bicycle at night without a front light and a red or yellow reflector or light in the rear. Speed limits are now going to be enforced. Like the old law, the new code fixes no positive speed limits, but places upon the driver the responsibility for operating his car with due regard for the safety and rights of others. It provides that he must not operate his car at a greater speed than is reasonable and proper with due regard to the traffic, but makes operation of a car above certain speeds prima facie evidence of reckless driving. These speeds are 15 miles an hour when a car approaches within 50 feet of a railroad or street car track where the driver's view is obscured when passing a school during recess or when children are going to and from school, when going around curves or on grades where the driver does not have a clear view 200 feet ahead, and when portions of a municipality or where traffic is congested. 20 miles an hour in residence districts and on streets where there are traffic officers or traffic control devices. Municipalities are permitted to fix a higher speed on arterial highways. 35 miles an hour under all other conditions. Municipalities are not permitted to make lower speed limits except they may fix lower limits for trucks whose weight exceeds 16,000 pounds. Anybody get the feeling that Pat's used to kind of like giving out directions and rules for stuff? I don't know. Um, our next, hi Lily. Um, our next reader is Jennifer Andres from the Historical Society. So the public library in Marshall has a long history. Um, eight years after Marshall was founded, the public library was organized. And this article is from the Marshall Daily Messenger in July, 20, July 25, 1939. 
Miss Rank Important in History of Library. Editor's note, this is the first of two articles dealing with the history of the Marshall Public Library. The next one, which will appear shortly, will be concerned with the past 35 years, when Miss Rank was the librarian. Miss Elizabeth Rank will retire as librarian of the Marshall Public Library on August 1st. She thus completes 35 years of public service to the Marshall community. And to honor her for her invaluable contribution to the cultural life of the city, a public reception will be held for her shortly, the date of which will be announced later. Ms. Rank will, however, remain as assistant librarian and general advisor. Her successor, chosen by the library board, will be Mrs. Merle Lennartson of Stillwater, who will assume her duties on August 1st. Since Ms. Rank has been so closely associated with the Marshall Public Library during its important and formative years, and since she has taken so influential a part in the molding of it into an outstanding institution in, of Marshall, it is fitting that a brief history of it be told here in connection with the announcement of her retirement. The first drive for a public library here was launched on February 11, 1880, when the Village Council authorized the establishment and made a tax levy of one mill on the dollar. The next year, 1881, the tax was combined with proceeds from dramatic entertainment and the sum of $420.16 was accumulated. The board of directors named by the council could not reach an agreement, however, and the plan of starting a library was in abeyance until 1885 when the council ordered the purchase of books. These were placed in the Wakeman store and Walter Wakeman was named the first librarian. This first library opened January 1st, 1886 and there were 500 volumes available for readers. In 1902, Andrew Carnegie the philanthropist, was solicited by the Marshall Art History Club to found a Carnegie Library here. The following year, Mr. Carnegie responded and offered to donate $10,000, providing the village would furnish a site and buying itself to pay $1,000 annually for maintenance. At the public meeting held March 4, 1903, Mr. Carnegie's offer was accepted and plans were laid for the new library. And that library is where the museum is now? Yes. The, library, the Carnegie yeah. Library, right. Um, awesome. And they wanted a library so badly they brought books to a store so they could have a library. How wonderful. Um, excellent. Our, our next reader is Shelby Flint reading about a new ambulance that came to town. I didn't pick these because of, of every, I didn't like relate it to you, right? Just so you know. <laughs> That's good to know. So just a month after Miss Rank retired from the library, there was another theme of public service that was um, discussed in the newspaper. Ray Camp offers new ambulance service. J.C. Raycamp has recently added a new service to the Raycamp Funeral Home located next to the post office on West Lyon Street. It is a new three-way 1939 Superior LaSalle combination ambulance and funeral coach. With the addition of this coach, Mr. Raycamp offers the public the latest and most modern of ambulance equipment. Furnished with the latest in cotches, cots and stretchers, it can be used for any kind of emergency. The interior is furnished in burgundy upholstery with transparent velvet drapes trimmed in silver. The patient's compartment is trimmed in burgundy mohair. <laughs> Somebody 
everybody thinking it through there, this been right. Um, uh, and it's raining, just for you, Mark, Perfect. because Mark's going to talk about the Tracy tornado. <laughs> heard that first thunder I thought to myself whoa that was like eight minutes early anyway uh, I'm reading uh, a little bit different story about the uh, for those of you that have been in the southwestern Minnesota uh, for a while uh, you you might have heard stories of the Tracy tornado and uh, these are two stories by Jerry Chapman from the Marshall Messenger of Saturday June 15th and the tornado happened on Thursday evening why we happened to drive to Tracy Thursday night, I'll never know. But the decision put us there when a killer tornado plowed its way through the center of town shortly after 7 p.m. Driving south on Highway 59, my wife questioned whether we should be leaving Marshall with the way the weather looked. Looking up, I remember thinking she had a point. But I shrugged it off, knowing how seldom bad storms ever really strike. A few minutes later, we were sitting at the A&W root beer stand on Highway 14 in Tracy. All the windows were down as we hunted the least breath of fresh air. In the west, the clouds had a strange yellow tint. Beyond them, the sky was white with wind. Then the rain beat down on the tin roof of the drive-in. Even though hail followed, I was relieved to watch the downpour, believing that nature had finally released itself. Hailstones banged away on the roof. We were glad our car was sheltered. When the last drop of root beer was gone, we pulled out into the downpour <clears throat> and were surprised to find that our windshield wipers could barely keep up with the deluge. Less than a block away, heading west, the hailstones smashed harder against the windshield. At first, they were marble-sized. Later, golf balls bounced on the streets. We both saw it in the same instant. It was too close to look like a funnel. It was just a huge black mass churning away two blocks south of the highway. The best way to describe it is to say that it plowed along. Staring at the black beast, I was so frightened I couldn't even speak. My God, it's a tornado. It's heading this way, my wife almost screamed. I whipped the car around in the road, and uh, the kids started to cry. The oldest were the worst. They knew what was happening. Later on, my four-year-old son told me he wasn't scared, and he really couldn't remember the cloud. I drove east on 14 as fast as I dared. The look on people's faces as they realized the tornado was coming was something to behold. It, it was a frightened mixture of fear and disbelief. Past the root beer stand and on through the residential area we sped. Now the hailstones were king size. One cracked against the front window, disintegrated, and the slush was swept away by the wipers. Other motorists had the same idea. And then the stories continued on page four. Now last week, uh, I didn't have page four, but thanks to Pam Gladys, I have page four. <clears throat> so you get a real treat. The people last week didn't get this. One, okay, one after the other, we speeded out of town. On the outskirts, I looked down at the speedometer. It registered 80 miles per hour. Just then, a family in a red sports coupe passed us like we were standing still. Behind, the twister boiled. We knew not its direction nor its speed, so we drove on hard. My wife kept looking for a culvert in which to hide. For the longest time, the funnel appeared to follow our path. But in reality, it was heading northeast. We watched it plow across the highway. It looked like it was outside of Tracy, but it was going right through the center of town. We finally stopped at Walnut Grove and the twister was still dealing out death and destruction behind. The time lapse was only five or 10 minutes, but the cloud wouldn't lift. Sometimes skinny, sometimes fat, it curved and dipped and clung to the ground. It was a rolling huge mass at the top, narrowing to what looked like a pinpoint below. In reality, that pinpoint was 200 yards wide. Suddenly, the huge coil just started to unwind. That's exactly what it looked like. Untwisting from the top down, the coil broke, rolled apart, and disappeared. 
Only the yellow-gray sky remained. The people were standing outside when we drove back through Tracy. The first evidence was small twigs in the highway. Then the twigs turned into limbs, and then the limbs into huge, uprooted trees. The further we drove, the worse it got. Broken glass and ripped lumber were everywhere. Men were out in the streets clearing the way. There was no organization yet, just a handful of men who knew that cleanup must start. On the right were overturned cars, gutted buildings, and a smashed pleasure boat. On our left were the hard-hit homes and the bare trees. A family's bed sat all alone in the upstairs of one demolished house. Just the bed. No walls, no roof, just the bed sitting on the floor. Finally, we got out of town. As we headed toward Marshall, the highway patrolmen were coming in, and the townspeople were out in their yards, wondering what to do and where they would go. It was a sight we'll never forget. And then in the same article, uh, which Pam and I ascertained this, this morning when we went to look for the rest of that one, um, it was a special insert edition um, into the Marshall Messenger that Saturday, June 15th. Um, Jerry Chapman um, also accounts uh, uh, an article entitled, Tracy Struggles to Its Knees. The town of Tracy slowly but surely crawled to its knees Friday morning after being flat on its back Thursday night, the victim of a treacherous twister that killed at least nine people and left hundreds homeless. Friday, the big cleanup began. For some, it was a matter of salvaging what they could from homes they would never live in again. While they were loading their belongings, health department officials were right behind them, nailing condemned signs on damaged walls. Others were more fortunate. They could clean up the mess by raking the yard, replacing the TV antenna, or patching the roof. Everywhere you looked, the cleanup was underway. A garage wrecker was towing a smashed car out of the debris. Richard Dwyer's caterpillar was digging into the ruins at the junior high school building. Two teenagers and their mom were throwing lumber into a trailer. As could be expected, there was confusion, too. Officials were hesitant to start cleanup work in residential areas for fear it would affect insurance appraisals. Yet men were all over, looking for something to do. One official summed up his feeling when he said, Let's go ahead. We've got help now. Come Monday morning, we'll be all alone with this mess. Downtown in the armory, the Red Cross and civil defense people were trying to locate missing persons. Everyone was asking questions. Few people had any answers. When asked for the list of victims, one lady replied, I'm sorry, we're not supposed to give that information out. Ten minutes later, another woman was manning the desk, and she was happy to provide the names of the known dead. Probably the most orderly place in Tracy Friday morning was the hospital. Walking down the quiet hall, it was hard to imagine that 72 people had been admitted and treated Thursday evening. While 50 people have been released, 22 are still hospitalized. Some of their relatives were watching and waiting in the anteroom. In the entryway, two young men were busy on shortwave radio sets. Standing in the doorway, a young National Guard trooper had orders to question everyone seeking entry. Driving back toward the heart of town, you couldn't help but notice the tremendous contrast. In an area that had escaped the tornado's fury, a young babysitter pushed a pair of little tykes in a park swing. Further on, an old man was hoeing in his garden as if nothing had happened. And so it went. On one hand, the deafening noise of chainsaws cutting uprooted trees and the roar of the big cats scooping up debris. On the other hand, the quiet of hospital corridors and nurses silently and skillfully going about their work. Tracy was crawling out of the rubble, striving to get back to its feet. I think I made it worse. Picture here actually uh, is a picture that won an award in the, 19th, in the late 1960s. Uh, but this is a picture of the photo cloud leaving Tracy. So, 
Um, okay. <laughs> Next up is Nadine to follow the tornado. Yes. <laughs> Speaking of tornadoes, here's Nadine. <laughs> Um, I'll see if I can do my best to distract you from the weather outside. Uh, this article is from May 8th, 1970. Uh, Richard Nixon was president and the United States was involved in the conflict in Vietnam. And SMSU was only a few years old. Protest Cambodia Kent State incidents. College students march downtown by Rich Owski. In the most penetrating student protest here to date, students from Southwest State College talked, listened, and marched against the broadening of the Southeast Asia conflict into Cambodia and the incident at Kent, Ohio State University in which four students were shot by National Guardsmen. Almost 200 students marched from the campus through downtown to the high school and back again in a protest which involved no major outbreak of incidents. At the high school, the police escorted marchers circled the building shouting, join us and strike now, and then congregated on the mall at the front entrance of the building for a few minutes. The group then marched through downtown and back to the college campus. Leaders of the group worked continually to police the students in the march, shouting orders to stay off the grass and to keep the march moving. There were a couple of incidents which were dispelled before major trouble could be started. When the group reached the corner of West College Drive and Saratoga Street, about 10 students ran out in front of the police car leading the march and refused to let it pass. The students sat down in front of the car for less than a minute before allowing the car to continue. One police officer attempted to, to disperse the sitting students, but the students moved on without help. When the group reached West College Drive and Main Street, about 50 students sat down in the intersection for a short time while policemen directed traffic around them. In a third incident near Eastside School, two trucks pulled over to the side of the road to let students pass. Students handed the drivers red ribbons, symbols of the student strike. The drivers cordially accepted the ribbons and the students cheered. <laughs> The march took on a family flavor when one man joined the group carrying a small child. Side note, that child would now be in their 50s. The march was followed by an address by State Senator Nicholas Coleman on the college campus mall. Afterwards, students and faculty took the microphone to state their opinions. Two young men told the students that the protest strike had to continue if it were to be effective. Two local high school students who said they had been suspended from school for leaving to attend the rally described the high school here as a prison and said striking students, quote, should really work on it, end quote. So Jan Locke was just saying that she thinks that perhaps the person that stopped with the child in arms may have been Bill. Oh, Our emeritus <laughs> faculty member Bill Heslip carrying one of his children who is definitely yeah. in their 50s now. Yes, for sure. <laughs> um, our next reader is Marcy Olson. I see a lot of uh, familiar SMSU faces, but if uh, there are any people watching this on TV, I wanted to point out that if you are familiar with SMSU history, you know that the student center we have now was built to replace one that was destroyed by a fire. And coincidentally, the one before our student center was built to replace one that was destroyed by a fire in 1971. And I'll be reading about that. This is from March 1971. Student union at college is gutted by fire. Extensive damage was done to the paddock, a steel building used as a student union at Southwest State College early Saturday morning. The blaze was discovered about 2.45 a.m. and Marshall firemen reported flames extinguished by 3.30 a.m. The fire is being investigated by the state fire marshal. The fire was just one incident that kept the campus and community in turmoil for several hours. Earlier, there was a disturbance in the gymnasium during the college's winter carnival. 
Later, there were incidents at Wiener Memorial Hospital and the police station. Shortly before midnight, two college co-eds became involved in a fight at the gym. One had won a cake in a dance game that was part of the carnival. The other girl attempted to take the cake away from her, a college spokesman said, and a cake-throwing fracas developed. <laughs> Several other students became involved before a security guard restored order. Although the carnival was to have lasted until 6 a.m. Saturday, it just sort of petered out, a college official said, and by 1 a.m. the campus seemed quiet. Later, sometime between 1 a.m. and 2.45, there was a disturbance outside between the food service building and the paddock, involving about 30 black and white students, males and females. Before a security guard restored order, there was some scuffling among the participants, but there were no injuries reported. Two male students after this confrontation asked for and received protection from campus security. Sometime later, a staff member who had been in a residence hall talking to students saw the fire in the paddock as he was returning toward the central academic building. He turned in the alarm. About 2 a.m., a male student went to Wiener Memorial Hospital. They rang the bell at the entrance. Hospital Administrator Ron Jensen said, when it took some minutes for a nurse to reach the glass, the door, the glass in the door was broken. Dr. W. M. Krasrowski said he treated the co-ed who was hospitalized overnight and released Saturday morning. She was suffering from hysteria, he said, but that was all. During the early morning hours, a group of students reportedly appeared at the police station. Captain George Davis said he could not comment on the incident except to say that it is being investigated. A college official said there seemed to be racial overtones involved in the incidents. He added that it was surprising because racial tensions that caused concerns over a month ago appeared to have eased. Back in January, two days of open convocations were held to relieve the tensions and a black studies program, one of the demands of the students, had been met. Fire Marshal Mel Hardy could not be reached for comment on his investigation of the paddock fire. The building, which is valued at $25,000, is owned by Dites and Crow Incorporated of Marshall and is leased to the college. The exterior of the building shows little sign of damage, but the interior was damaged extensively. The paddock was equipped with office equipment, vending machines, snack bar furniture, and similar fixtures. On just a side note, I did some research to find out what $25,000 building was worth, and it's worth about $182,000 today. And just before this event began earlier this evening, Jennifer Andres from the museum shared the location of this shop that I'm going to be reading about was uh, on the second floor of the building on the corner of 3rd and Main. I think it's vacant right now. It has a for rent sign on it, but it would be across from Columbia Imports and right next to Ness's Natural. So that's where this was located, up on the second floor. I had not met Madam Smith until just this afternoon, but I have a hunch she was uh, a colorful character and uh, some real interesting lines of reasoning, if you will. Also, uh, this article written by Richard Owski, same uh, staff writer that wrote the article that Nadine shared with us. He was a staff writer for The Messenger at that time. And this is based on an interview. So there's lots of quotes here. I will not provide the air quotation marks. That would probably annoy you all if I did that. So provide your own and uh, here's how it goes. 
The firm of Madam Smith Furrier is closed. Its proprietor and only employee the past 22 years has locked the door and set out for Minneapolis where she will set up shop in the big city. It's a foolish financial move for a woman my age, Madam Smith admitted, as she paced around her untidy workshop one story above Main Street on the last day of business in Marshall last Saturday. Madam Smith doesn't like to reveal her age, it's not good for business, but reluctantly admits to 72. I like Marshall, she says reassuringly. I think it's the greatest little city in the world. But her reason for leaving her home of nearly a quarter century is one not many past the age of retirement would understand. I'm too well established here, and I don't have to worry about anything, she said. I choose to worry. It's so definitely secure that you lose your initiative and your talents, she explained philosophically. Marshall has been a great city and nobody can ever say it is not one of the greatest little cities in the country, she repeated, but added, I don't choose to be at a comfortable standstill. It's too dull for an older person, she continued. I've never regretted being here as long as I've been here, but I'm getting too old to stay here. Madam Smith said she has made fur coats, caps, stoles, and other fur pieces for about 100 clients a year while working in Marshall. To make a mink coat takes about 10 days. In 1963, she made a chinchilla piece for Mrs. Muriel Humphrey. Attention brought from the fur led to an invitation to work for six months for André Sauzé, a furrier in Paris, whose salons are located right on the main drag in Paris, according to Madam Smith. Although Madam Smith never took up the offer, she will always remember that the offer was made. A framed letter from M. Sauzé or, or adorn the wall of her Marshall shop and will accompany her to Minneapolis. Madam Smith acquired her pseudonym while working for the French dressmaker Madame Cosette in St. Paul from 1919 to 1921. All of the girls who worked for Madame Cosette were called by Mademoiselle. When Mademoiselle Smith was married, she became Madame Smith to Madame Cosette. To this day, she prefers Madame to her given name, Jana. For those who know her, Madame Smith has profound advice ranging from individuality of design, I don't design from patterns, I design from for people to the evils of marriage. And she has some unique views on what goes on around here. Our young hippies around here, probably some of those that were demonstrating, our young hippies around here are wonderful people, she said, in a matter-of-fact sort of expression. The rift between many of the young and many of the old is caused by the fact that the young often do what they want to do or what they think should be done, while their older counterparts feel they cannot, according to the self-minded furrier. Fragments of Madam Smith's philosophy are scattered on the walls of her workshop in the form of posters, clippings, and cards. On one wall, written in handwriting on the wallpaper, are the words, a quote from someone, she doesn't know who, Madam Smith feels are most important. Today is the first day of the rest of my life.
Thank you. This weather thing's kind of weird. I want to thank uh, Sheila for putting this reading together. Um, the articles that um, everybody is reading from are taken from the various newspapers that have been a part of this community and this region since the Prairie Schooner in 1873. That was the first newspaper in Marshall. Um, it's taken on many different names from that. News Messenger, Messenger Independent, Messenger, Daily Messenger, Lyon County Reporter, Lyon County Independent. For 13 years there were two newspapers in town uh, competing with one another and the current newspaper that you read today, The Independent, it is The Independent, it's not The Marshall Independent. The Independent uh, was started in 1974. It was kind of a combination of uh, uh, born out of uh, economic necessities um, from the competing uh, parties there. Um, it also, um, these articles are also uh, what will be a part of the uh, Marshall 150th uh, anniversary book. The um, that will take place uh, in August and it will run concurrently with the uh, Sounds of Summer competition. Um, all sorts of uh, family friendly and other events, food events. Um, there'll be a signature art piece uh, placed in Independence Park uh, that's quite impressive. Uh, uh, Mrs. Whitney planters uh, will be available. Just all sorts of things. There'll be a special Brow Brothers beer. Steve Klein is making a, a special fudge uh, for that celebration. But the book itself um, is being put together by a subcommittee of individuals who go through all of the all of these newspapers that I've mentioned. Uh, that some are available, the earlier ones online through the State Historical Society and others are hardbound in, uh, in Jennifer's uh, museum down there and in the fifth floor of the SMSU library, uh, the Southwest uh, History Center. So um, it, it, it should be an interesting um, publication. Today I'm reading um, from an article, August 9th, 1971, it was a Monday, and by Rich Owski. County officials moved to put lid on pot growing wild in area. A sort of illegal agricultural business in Lyon County will be wiped out someday if county officials are successful in their work to control noxious weeds. The one weed in particular that is receiving increased attention is marijuana, which grows wild in fields and groves and along fence lines and roadsides throughout the county. The business is that of cutting the wild plants, drying and processing them and then selling the leaves in a tobacco-like form to those who smoke it. The messenger was told by one source that the people in the Marshall area make, it, make a living processing and selling marijuana. Working, work to control the weed has been going on in the state for the past 10 years, but a more vigilant effort to control it, at least in Lyon County, is underway now. Don Rowling, County Weed Inspector, emphasized the need to crack down on its growth of noxious weeds, particularly marijuana, last week at a meeting of the county commissioners. Here's kind of the line of the story. Rowling said that many farmers who have marijuana growing on their farms do not recognize the weed. Those that should know all about it don't, and those that shouldn't know about it, the kids, can spot it a quarter of a mile away, Rowling said. 
This is very, uh, it's coming down. <laughs> The weed has been growing in the area for decades, but the problem has existed in Marshall only in the last five years, according to Marshall Police Chief Chet Weiner. Recent crackdown on the smuggling of marijuana from Mexico into the United States have caused a shortage of the finer Mexican marijuana, leading local users to harvest more of the local, lower quality plant, Sheriff John Tomasic thinks. The for whatever reason, local marijuana is being picked and processed more now than in the past. Because of its inferior quality, it often is treated with alcohol or boiling water to improve its strength. Rowling said that the amount of marijuana in the county probably is as great as it was 10 years ago when it was first taken when steps were first taken to control it. He said patches of the weed have been eliminated permanently, but now new patches are continually being found. There are varying theories on how the weed found its way north. Marijuana was grown in some parts of Minnesota and Iowa as a cash crop during World War II. The plant was used for its fiber. Although there, although there probably weren't any Lyon County farmers where it was raised, the plant could have spread from other areas. Another theory is that migrant workers coming north to work brought it with them, often dropping marijuana seeds as they traveled along railroad tracks. Areas near railroads are supposed to be a common place to find the plant growing now. The fight here against marijuana is more part of a general crackdown on the growth of all noxious weeds than an attempt to eliminate what is believed by some to be a serious health hazard. The campaign against marijuana is a low-keyed scientific project to gradually get the plant under control. Rowling said that it is getting too late in the year to stop the plants before seeding. It's been a good year for the growth of marijuana as well as other noxious weeds. The best way for local farmers to help control the weed, Rowling said, is to learn to identify the plant and then contact township or county weed inspection officials to arrange for its control. So that's probably more than you needed to know about, uh, about that. Thank you all for coming out on such a night as this. And I was thinking that if we were in the old building where the museum is now, we'd be doing this in the basement and we probably would have no idea that anything was happening because it was so um, insulated down there. Very dark. Um, I brought uh, two books. These are by Elaine Conyers, who many of you knew as the former director of the Lyon County Museum. She was there for 21 years. She was on the city council, and I also found out that she was a police commissioner for two uh, terms, which I had no idea. She was on a lot of boards and commissions, and she wrote a monthly column in The Independent for those 21 years. Jennifer is continuing to do columns. I hope that you get yours published, too. Yes. So you should look for those. Um, so I just looked up a few things. There are five volumes of these, and I just have one and two. You can check them out here at the library. You can also find the Marshall Independent way back to 1879 on microfilm here. So you can come and go down that rabbit hole, because believe me, when somebody calls and says, can you look up this obituary? We end up spending a little more time than that because we find some article that catches our interest. So I think I'll start with an appropriate one, flooding. This is from the June 14, 1907 Lyon County Reporter. 
uh, title, The Wettest in Years, The Roaring Redwood Nearly Establishes New Records. The great and mighty redwood is overflowing its banks this week and is doing considerable damage for miles. The approaches of nearly all the bridges in this part of the country have been washed out. The Third Street Bridge in Marshall can be crossed safely, though the big retaining wall along the river has half fallen into the river and the river flows across the street nearly a foot deep. The river is probably the highest since 1881. Up around Sam Snap's place, the sidewalk floats about and if you are quick enough, you can get across. Down at the 4th Street Bridge, a wooden leg was fished out. That's a fun thing. We haven't heard much about our pioneer people, so I, I'll read a little bit. This is from uh, some letters written by Mary Carpenter. She and her husband George, uh, in July of 1873, made a 200 mile journey from Cascade Township in southeast Minnesota to homestead in Grandview Township, Lyon County. Uh, and so it, throughout her letters, she has many comments about life here. The first two years here will be very, will be hard, very probably. If we struggle through them, then we stand a chance to do pretty well, I think. The country here is very pleasant in summer. We have the railroad cars and sights for miles. The children are well and hearty. There will be a paper published in Marshall soon. One year ago, Marshall consisted of one sod house. Now it is quite a thriving railroad town. I wouldn't go back where we lived before here for anything. She complained about uh, the leaky 10-foot shanty that she lived in, and she says, those who live where wood is cheap and plentiful little know the inconveniences that many prairie settlers have to put up with. I call tending straw fire one sort of slavery, for someone must stay right by the stove and feed it constantly. It makes life seem long sometimes. In 1885, there was still no improvement in their family economic situation. Our crops did not turn out so well as we expected this year. And there was so much that had to be put over last year that must be paid this year that it made us very short of money. But as usual, we live in hopes for another year. In 1886, her husband bought more land. George thinks this will be better than renting, but it all looks to me like hard work and poor pay. We have been hoping for too many years. Her health began to fail, and she died July 9, 1889, at the age of 49. She had 11 children, six of whom survived. The cause of death was listed in her obituary as melancholy tending to derangement. Very sad. Very sad. You may not have known that there was a Marshall Business College. It opened in 1901 and was located on the second floor of the Baldwin Building at 112 North 3rd Street, across the alley from the Lyon County Museum. Um, the marketing of the college especially targeted men. Why is it that young men prefer to work from five to eight dollars per week when they might be earning twice as much if they understood shorthand and typewriting? It is a grave mistake to suppose that stenography is a profession for girls alone. 71 students were listed as enrolled in 1903 from many communities in southwest Minnesota and one from New York. So I guess it must have been a pretty good school. It closed in 1910. So I guess maybe it wasn't such a good school. And lastly, just for fun, this is from the Saturday, April 15th, 1961 Marshall, Marshall Messenger. The title is, KMHL Thief May Be an Egghead. A thief went with an apparent like for classical music and a distaste for Elvis Presley and his rock and roll contemporaries broke into KMHL last Wednesday night and walked off with $200 worth of records. 
According to Lyon County Sheriff Roland Rands, the thief, or thieves, took some 55 records which ranged from the semi-classical works of Eugene Ormandy to the conservative New York Philharmonic Orchestra. A few current hits were taken. Entry into the radio station located east of the city on Highway 19 was gained sometime between 12.15 a.m. and 6 p.m. The thieves entered the building by breaking a window to the back door. The case is currently under investigation. So there are some things from Elaine's books, which I hope you have a chance to browse through sometime. Thank you all for coming. So, uh, so again, thank you. Uh, and I just need to give a shout out to a couple of people who really made uh, this evening possible. Uh, Jan Lawaji in the History Center at SMSU has been going through a lot of different things. Some of these articles you'll find in the book, some of them are extra articles that aren't going to make it in the book. Um, and Pam Gladys, who's the university librarian, also has a hand in that. Paula as well, and Jennifer um, down at the Historical Society Museum, really. And then all of you who, who said yes and then did stuff like looked up stuff and figured out how to say names and things like that. I really appreciate that because just, just get you all together because I like y'all and then you just do stuff for me, which is super fun. So I just want to thank you for doing that. And uh, as always, because some of you have, have done this several times for us and to do these readings and things like that is a lot of fun. So thanks a lot and uh, have fun outside. <laughs>